Okay, this is the sixth and last lecture on ethics in action. Um, uh, the meeting at the Pontifical Academy to bring together people from uh, different religious traditions and humanist traditions to agree on a uh, unifying foundation for the, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And this is also the 18th lecture in the series on creating a universal and international sustainable civilization. All right. Um, so the conclusion, at the conclusion of the conference, these were, this was the context, it was 2015. Um, all right, the conclusion. A virtue ethics for the 21st century would have much in common with previous secular and religious virtue ethics traditions, including a focus on moral habits, rationality, and the telos of human beings, which is the final cause. So the notion of final causes was uh, theoretically obliterated in the modern Western tradition during the Enlightenment, but it's been brought back. Luckily, um, I think the reason why it was rejected was not was because there was a new model for science to exploit nature, to re-engineer nature, and a new model for the human psyche to, to re-engineer the psyche. And um, uh, Immanuel Kant's a priori reasoning, dualistic reasoning, and um, Jeremy Bentham, the utilitarians other than Mill, their reductionistic uh, behavioral psychology is very deliberately rejecting that telos because the telos was corrupted by the Aristotelians who used it to legitimate their maintaining power and privilege. Edmund Burke argued that uh, land, which was actually the that nation's source of wealth should be inherited. And I think that was a mistake. Um, so when conservative means conserving the same class structure or letting, you know, there's a house of nobles, but allowing there to be one house of commons or whatever is not, it was corrupt. And it was also used to justify colonialism and all sorts of stuff. So obviously the old view of final cause, the telos, um, needed to be tweaked um, partly in its understanding of causality, although that's coming back a lot more, uh, but mostly in the way that it was lived out in the culture, the entrenched class system. So it needs to be uh, incorporated, you have to incorporate knowledge from modern science to make sure we don't decide, you know, everything about Aristotle's scientific claims was right because it wasn't. And then moderation and temperance are necessary virtues for restraining our sometimes monstrous and insatiable desires, obviously. Um, a life of prudence is a life of practical wisdom. The prudent person is thoughtful, sometimes intentionally slow, even cautious. Prudence demands patience, anticipation of the consequences of one's actions, humility when consequences are uncertain. So if people want to go back to lecture number two and lecture number three, this is where I spell out all of the virtues very specifically. Lecture number two is concerned with especially the personal virtues of, mod of temperance and moderation and courage. And then lecture number three is where the focus is on practical wisdom because it includes political virtues. 
Solidarity and love are unifying virtues for a moral economy. Love demands that one value and work toward the well-being and good of the other, which is in fact shared well-being. A modern virtue ethics must center on the notion of an agreed common good, the achievement of which requires democratic deliberation in both politics and economics. So it isn't just deliberation in politics and economics, it's also shared power. Um, it's not only that people listen to each other and uh, a person with power makes all the final decisions, it would be that political power is distributed fairly broadly and economic development and economic opportunity is also shared pretty widely so you can have a strong middle class. Our initiative demonstrates there's a widely shared unforced consensus on what this common good is as outlined by the sustainable development goals. There's a wide array of opportunity for cooperation and collaboration on issues of common concern. So I hope you would pick up this book and maybe read the book to um, find out what else they said and also get in contact with some of the people that are mentioned. Um, modern virtue ethics has to involve unifying the intellectual virtues, which are STEM, and those are the ones that have changed and will continue to change with the moral virtues to make practical wisdom possible. Quote, modern science will be of assistance in updating virtue ethics for our contemporary situation in the sense of better informing us of the kinds of ends and virtues necessary for a sustainable future and what would best facilitate training in virtuous behavior. We need to more broadly develop and promulgate ethic education, ethics education. The liberal arts give us a goal to reach. We must always be oriented towards some sort of good as Aristotle, Augustine, and others have cogently demonstrated. The good that education should aim us toward is that of a sustainable and integral human development. So um, when I've taught philosophy, I've always encouraged my students not to either double major or to major in something else where they can get a job and then to minor in religion and philosophy. So my program is a religion and philosophy program. So I've had to do, my teaching has had to be very integrated with um, many, many disciplines, interdisciplinary, integrate religion and philosophy. I also taught philosophy of art, um, ethics, business ethics, environmental ethics, so, so I have, you know, taught a number of classes that are um, perfectly compatible with this holistic point of view. I also taught how Athens lost their great democracy, what they had and how they lost it. And so many of those same types of corruptions are very much alive and well today. I've obviously taught Aristotle's virtues and how they relate in many, many ways. But I've taught the Greek view of education includes tragedy um, and people going to extremes and the gods representing patterns in human behavior, overreacting. So I do think including tragedy in a system of education is important. I've also written about Jungian psychology and the, the shadow, what he calls the primitive side of the mind needing to be educated through myths, and so I do think that that's important also, uh, bringing all of this together. Indonesia could take a more prominent place in the world stage because of its political ideology and culture. However, it could also revert to religious extremism or to anti-Chinese disruption. Every nation in the world has the same kinds of choices to make religious extremism or toleration, ethnic discrimination and, or even animosity or integration, a gap between the rich and the poor or a strong middle class, the union of science with religion and values or antagonism between science and religion 
core science facts and values. Most of all, the desire to retain a free and open society where citizens participate in public life and become informed about political leaders on the one hand or authoritarianism on the other. And I do think that academics especially should know that they ought to lead the way in trying to integrate science with values, trying to integrate spirituality with um, secular humanism, trying to integrate these various theories, these various philosophies, and to have a way of life that really promotes dialogue and, and a free and open society. So Socrates was not a professor. He didn't profess things. He asked people what they think. And so when I teach on the first day of class, I tell the students, I don't know what you think about the meaning of life, about God, about justice, about beauty, about virtue. But I'm going to give you a number of readings that our history has passed down to us. It's some of the best, most profound, wisest readings that, that I can assign. And you have to tell me what you think. And you have to get to know your own mind. So on the first day of class, they have to write their worldview, and they don't even know what the word means, but I tell them it's whatever you think it means. And then every class, they have to think about what's their takeaway from that reading, and do they do they think they're going to incorporate it in their final paper? And then their final paper, they have to give their worldview as of whatever date that is that they hand it in. So... And I do want them in their worldview to integrate religion and philosophy, science and values. I want them to integrate the other classes that they take at Lyon, our liberal arts school, um, so that they can have something they can carry with them in their head as they graduate. And hopefully they can be committed to avoiding polarization, avoiding black and white thinking, realizing that if you want a democracy, you have to listen to people and you have to adjust and you have to compromise. Um, but the grown-ups, hopefully the grown-ups in their lives are setting a good example, but I don't really know. And of course the newspaper tends to sensationalize. We're all in this together. Even with its great wealth and democratic history, the United States is also being threatened by a growing desire for a strong man who will claim to fix our problems for us and then who will use the power he's given to help his friends and family, destroy the natural environment, create animosity with all the other nations, and create more disruption, which he will claim only he can solve. It's amazing that these same patterns exist throughout the world. So America, I don't think it's the beacon of democracy anymore. I don't think anybody thinks that. Um, the question is whether we have become the beacon of how to lose a democracy, whether every authoritarian leader looks to us to find pointers for what they should say, the kind of rhetoric they should use, or the kind of institutions they should have, or the kind of tax cuts for the rich so that they can gain power and destroy their own democracies. So it's pretty discouraging, but still, I hope every college educated student and college level teacher will be completely dedicated to preserving a free and open society, international cooperation and sustainability. So because I had all the advantages that have led me to have this job, I feel like it's my responsibility to keep trying. And I do think everyone who would listen to these uh, videos, these lectures, would also feel compelled because if educated people don't dedicate themselves to trying to educate either the next generation of leaders or their fellow citizens, and also to learn from them. I mean, 
if you don't think you can learn from somebody else, they won't learn anything from you. So I always learn a lot from my students. Um, it varies what I learn, but I always learn from each one of them. I learn about people. I learn about my own blindnesses, assumptions I had made. I learn sometimes to be more worried about something and sometimes to be less worried about something. I sort of learn about the latest stereotypes, you know, that I've kind of gotten into the back of my mind because I haven't paid close enough attention. You know, the country's changing so fast, it's really hard to tell what's going on. I came to Lyon College in 1996, and it was truly extremely different. So you just have to always keep, um, try to keep up with what's going on, listen, talk. That's what Socrates did. He went out to the marketplace every day and talked to whoever happened to be around. Um, and so Ponchisilla is, to me, very compatible with that sort of Socratic way of living and ruling. So I hope I hope the best. And now we will move into a, another section of the lectures. <laughs>